Welcome to How to Sell More. Today, we are digging into how to structure the perfect discovery call with Nikki Rausch. Now, Nikki has over 25 years experience in sales, and the minute that you hear her speak in this conversation, you will understand why organizations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and NASA has turned to her for help. But there's so much more to Nikki than just her impressive sales accolades. She's an author, she's a sought after speaker, and she's the powerhouse behind the Sales Maven Society. Oh, I can't wait to share with you this conversation that's coming up. It is amazing. I'm Mark Drager. Let's dive in. So Nikki Roush, you are known as the sales maven and you have, I I was going to say decades, but I don't, I want to be polite. (laughs) You have a lot of experience helping with professional sales teams and helping people transition into sales. And when I saw you coming up on the list, I was like, Ooh, there is room for us to have a conversation that we all need to have. And that is how to structure a perfect discovery call. Because in my experience, no matter how deep you are in a business, no matter how much revenue you've sold, no matter where you are in your journey, sometimes we got to get back to basics. And the discovery call is such a key part of every sales process. So help me understand, just from your point of view, what is the way we should start thinking about discovery calls? Well, first of all, (laughs) the, the objective of the call is to really understand what's going on for the prospect. Do they have a problem? Do they have a need? And can I ask really smart questions that not only plants the seed in their mind, that I have a solution for them, but also allows for me to determine whether or not they're an ideal client. And if so, then we can move through the rest of the conversation. But it's, you know, one of the mistakes I often find is that people get so excited about talking to whoever it is they're going to talk to and they do all this research and they do all this prep and they put together all these like, oh, I'm going to offer them this and then I'm going to do this with them. And it's like, you haven't even gotten on the call with them yet. Like, (laughs) it's okay to do a little research, but, you know, like calm down Because then you go into it and you word vomit all over people. And that actually is not going to earn the business for you. Uh Uh-oh. Did I just do that in my opening for this podcast? No. Did I just word vomit all over you? (laughs) No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. The idea though is first and foremost, in the discovery call, you want to set the stage of what's going to happen. And the reason you set the stage is because it allows for you to be more efficient and effective and it shows a respect to the other person that we're not we're not here to like coach frankly i'm not here to give free advice we're here to determine you know what's going on for you and do i have a solution and if so with your permission i'll put that solution in front of you the way to set it up at the very beginning and this is probably the most missed step anytime somebody says to me i'm struggling to close on my calls my consult calls and i always say what's your preframe at the start of the call and they go, what now? What do you mean? <laughs> like, okay, we got to have a preframe. Preframe is a way of pacing and leading. So we got to pace the other person first. We set the stage. We create safety in the very beginning of the call. When you do that, you're now setting yourself up to guide the conversation. If you let the prospect guide the conversation, it's going to be a time suck usually. It's also going to go off in crazy directions or you're going to miss out on the time to actually earn their business because they're talking too much, frankly. I love this idea of the preframe. Um, but you also mentioned something that people tend to prepare far too much for the discovery call. So mm-hmm. is the perfect discovery call, in fact, start... It's almost like a bit like a morning routine. You know, Everyone talks about morning routines. Well, a morning routine starts with what you do the night before. So does the best discovery calls really start with what you do to prep for it? Or, or does that is that kind of... a doesn't even matter. It's just when we get into it, what do we do step one with the preframe? If you already know what it is that you offer and you're really clear on what your business is, what your offer is, I frankly don't think you should be doing a ton of research. Now, should you know about the company you know that you're going to go in and, and pitch? Yes. Should you understand a little bit about like who you're meeting with? Yes. But doing a bunch of a bunch of research and and maybe not even the research part, doing a bunch of prep as to what it is that you're going to pitch is probably a mistake because if you don't even understand what their need or their problem is yet, how could you possibly have the right solution? Right. So to me, yes, you can do a little bit of research, but if you're spending 
frankly, more than an hour, you're probably wasting your time. And you're going to go in with a lot of preconceived notions. I was going to say preconceived notions. Uh, yeah. You're going to get tunnel vision. Yes. You're, you're not going to be able to kind of like dance, if that's the right word, with the person that you're across yeah. and make it feel real and spontaneous and tailored for them, right? Yeah. And, you know, from all of my years in corporate, one of the things that one of the best compliments that I used to get often is when I would go out and I, so I worked at the manufacturer level and I would do ride days with dealers and distributors that were selling our product and putting me in rooms to present to their prospective clients. And what people would often say is, you never do the same presentation twice, but yet you always hit the points. And I was like, because I am there to understand what is the most interesting thing to the person I'm in conversation with. And then I'm going to focus on those things. So if I go in with a pre-recorded, you know, like presentation that I've got memorized, then it's like, well, what do you even need me for? I could just send you a video and I could word vomit the whole time. And that I personally think sales is something that you do with another person, not to another person. And that is kind of this whole idea. If you go in with this two attitude, like I'm here to convince you to buy from me. Then what happens, again, you word vomit, you don't listen, you don't ask the right questions. And the person leaves kind of feeling like, that felt gross. Like, I don't even think this person cared anything about me, about my company, about what we need. So like, they're not going to be the people that we hire. That's going to be the company that we bring on. So you have to go in and be nimble. Like you said, like you have to be willing. Well, my all-time favorite quote is, blessed are the flexible for they shall not be bent out of shape. You got to be flexible in a sales conversation. That is such a great line. So I'm thinking about a few things you've mentioned now, because I really okay. want to break down the anatomy of a great discovery call. So okay. we come in and and naturally there's going to be this moment where it's decided who is leading this call. Yes. And I've never personally struggled with this because uh, I tend to do two things. Either I follow their lead and they get to a point where they're kind of done talking. And I say, those are all amazing things. And you know what? I think what we'll find is that as we work through this, we're going to answer all of your questions. But first, let me ask you, and I kind of just take control of the conversation. Or uh, they sit there and they're like, they just don't know what to do next. Yeah. And there's this pregnant pause and I'm like, well, that's my cue. Yeah. I guess to step in and start talking. Uh, so we have to take control of the conversation. But explain more to me about this idea of future pacing, of the pre-frame, mm -hmm. of, of making sure that because I fall victim of this. I would much rather just shoot the shit with people and get to yeah. know their business and talk to them than actually structure this in a way where you know why I'm here. I know why I'm here. Let's not dance around it. Like, uh, I'm not sure I like that, but I need to do that more. And we, I think we all do. So how do we structure the preframe? So the preframe is the first thing you're going to do is acknowledge the amount of time and the purpose of the call. Like, so the purpose of our conversation today is to find out a little bit about, about you, about your business and see if what I offer is the right fit. We're scheduled to chat for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever the time is. Frankly, if it's more than 30, you're probably not doing a well done discovery call. So you're going to establish that time. And the reason the time piece is so important is because right now in our society, most of us live and breathe our calendars and our calendars are full. So you don't want somebody in the conversation, you haven't checked with them about the amount of time they've got you don't want them thinking like, should I say to Mark that I really only have 20 minutes and not 30 because I need to leave because I have another meeting? And now they're all up in their head and they're having a hard time paying attention to the conversation that you're having with them because they're worried about like, what should I say or when should I say it? So just check and go, does that still work in your schedule? Like, yes or no? Chances are the answer is yes because you've set this meeting. And then the way you take the lead and the conversation is you ask permission to take the lead. So in order for this time to be productive and meaningful for you, is it okay if I start with a couple quick questions? Now, That's maybe good. you want to let them start, but if you let them start, you never know when they're going to finish. Yeah, yeah, 25 minutes later, and they're like, that was a great talk. And you're like, I, I didn't figure anything out. <laughs> I don't even know what I need to know yet to see if you're even an ideal client. So when you ask permission, you set the stage and now you've created safety because now they know what's going to happen. You're going to ask some questions. So once you get that, that's your preframe. And now, so this is what I'm talking about. You pace them 
So you you check and you you make sure that you position it as. So notice I didn't say. Um, in order for me to decide whether or not I want to work with you, I need to ask you Ouch. questions. That's all about me, right? And yet yeah. people say these I statements all the time. But if I say, in order to make this time meaningful and productive for you, is it okay if I start with a couple quick questions? Because now I've said, hey, this is about you. And are you okay if I start with questions? As soon as they say yes to that, they have given you permission to lead the conversation. Because the person who's asking the questions in the conversation typically holds the power. And now we're going to balance out the power during the discovery call because they need to have their opportunity to ask you questions too. But if you let them start, you never know where you're going to go. But if you start and you've got your set list of questions... Now, you can have a set list of questions and you should. Doesn't mean you have to follow it question by question. And you should still have this conversational piece to the conversation, like to the to the discovery call. So it's okay to have a set list of questions and bob and weave with the questions as appropriate. But going in with no agenda and no set list of questions, again, it's like, what's that Lewis Carroll quote? Like if if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Yeah, you yeah. need to know where you're going. And your so, set list of questions should set you up for that. Let me ask you, mm-hmm. how do you feel about questions or, or statements even like starting off in the discovery call by saying like, you know why I'm here and I know why you're here, but I am not here to sell you anything today. There's nothing you can buy from me today. All I'm trying to do is figure out X, Y, Z to make sure that blah, blah, blah for you. Do you feel like that is beneficial or does that start to shift the the purpose of the conversation away from sales and you actually want them to know that you are there for a sales call? Uh, If that statement is actually true, I'm not opposed to it, (laughs) but I'm also not a fan of saying to somebody like, I don't, you can't buy from me and I'm not here to sell you anything because this is probably not true. You are there to sell. Otherwise, why are we having this conversation? So I always think you should stand in integrity. Now you don't need to like say to them, I'm here to take your money today. Like it doesn't need to be like that. But it's okay to say By the to end them, of this call, I am going to have your credit card number. You will have spent $25,000 and you're going to feel great about it. Yeah, you're going to be so happy. So it's also okay in your pre-frame, you could even say now at the end of our conversation... You know, if it makes sense for us to talk about ways to work together, we'll do that too. And you'll have an opportunity to make a decision today, even if you want. So Mm. I'm just saying like, hey, I'm throwing it out there. I want people to know you can go ahead and decide. You can pay me $25,000 today on this call. I'll happily take it as long as it makes sense for you and for me. Because sometimes you get into a discovery call and based on the answer somebody gives you, you realize they're not a good fit for what I offer. Or frankly, as an entrepreneur, I don't want to work with this client. So in that case, you're going to bless and release these people and you should do it as quickly as possible so as to not waste their time and yours. Okay. I, I We're going we're gonna to jump ahead later. Like okay. at, towards the end, I want to talk about how to close these calls. So the yeah, best yeah. way to close it, the best way to offload someone who is not a good fit without insulting them. Yeah, uh, yeah, or, I got that. Or whatever. We'll get to that in a second. But in the middle section, Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that's that's where powerful questions is really going to be your best friend, right? Yes. And the questions that you should ask, you, I mean, you're going to have some set list standard kind of sales questions. Uh, what's your time frame? What's your budget? Are you, are you trying to figure out if people are, are like are the different levels of awareness? Are you trying to figure out if people are problem aware, solution aware, how deep they are in terms of their research to see if you need to go into education mode? at a high level versus us versus them mode versus um, why you might even want a solution like this? Like, are you trying to figure that out on the discovery call? I'm trying to figure out what's the problem or what's the need. And I'm also trying to plant the seed about my solution during the questions that I'm asking. So one of the first questions I always recommend asking is like, what prompted you to set up this time? Or what prompted you to agree to have this meeting with me? Because right there, they're probably going to give you some information that is going to be revealing. Now, I'm taking notes during these calls. I'm writing down key phrases. I'm writing down key words, things that are popping up for me of like, oh, this is something right now. I can already tell that I'm going to be able to help them with this. Now, just for clarity's sake, when you're in the position of asking the questions, what you should not do is ask a question, let them answer, start selling a solution. And then ask another question, let them answer. And now your solution has probably changed. So then you sell something else. 
your questions and during that part of the process, keep it clean. Don't you don't need to comment. You don't need to talk about, oh yeah, we've got something great for you, or oh my, like just keep it nice and clean. Get the information that you need to establish whether or not they're an ideal client. And again, start to plant the seeds for them about how your solution is going to meet that need and solve the problem. Okay. And what do you mean by plant the seeds? Like yeah. I, I've seen different strategies where people start to dig into like let's say you're selling a solution that helps people sell more. It's yeah. easy to understand, right? I sell something that's going to help you sell more. I yeah. would want to know your average sale cost and your average, um, maybe the number of clients and your current volume and then what your hopes are for what you might get. And I might get a chart and say, okay, you know, it's 25 grand and you're currently selling three of these a month. But if you move that to eight a month, look at what it does for your top line revenue and blah, blah, blah. Like, is that what you're meaning by planting a seed or or how are you approaching this? So I'm going to approach it with like, what are the things that that make my solution unique? And I'm going to form questions around that. So versus telling them how my solution is going to, you know, 2x or 10x or whatever their sales, I'm going to ask some questions that would plant that seed. So for instance, one of the things I'm known for is I teach clients how to create curiosity when they're talking about the product or service. So one of the questions that I ask is, you know, how proficient are you at creating curiosity when you're talking about your product or service? Now, most of the time when I ask that question, people are like, I don't know that I know how to create curiosity. Well, because I asked the question, it always it already plants the seed. Like Nikki wouldn't have asked me that question unless she knows how to teach me to create curiosity. Mm-hmm. Do you know how to bring storytelling into your proposals? And when you're laying out a solution, what do you mean storytelling? Okay, so see how it's, it's, it's starting to plant the seed. So with your example of this 25,000... And you might ask the question then, so what's your average sale price? Okay, what, you know, where, what's your current volume right now? And what do you, like, what's the goal? Like, what are you looking to get to in the next year? What has stopped you from getting there? Okay, so are you looking for something that's gonna... So based on your answer, what the goal is, it sounds like you're looking for something that is gonna help you 10x what you're doing. Is that right? Okay, so you just planted the seed like, I get your problem because of the answers that you gave me. Like I'm starting to get your problem and I'm just seeing like, am I on the right track? I know I'm on the right track because I understand the numbers, right? You know, if they're at 25,000 and they want to get to whatever is, I guess the 25,000 was the price of your... Yeah, thing. that's fine. Okay, maybe so, we want to sell higher volume. Maybe yeah. we want to increase our pricing. Maybe we yeah. want more profit margins built in or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So if you... Yeah, so that's a great one. So... What's your average sale price? What's your average margin? What's the goal this year in regards to sales for you? Well, our goal is to increase our margin. Okay. Do you have a goal for that? Where are you in relation to reaching that goal? Wherever they say. Okay. So it looks like we're looking to increase your margin by at least 20%. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So I just established like, I get it. Like I understand what the, what the problem is. And now I'm going to start to plant some seeds. So what are some ways? so good. Uh, The other day, last week, I was at at an event and I heard this business coach. Now, I haven't had a business coach in my life for the last few years. But last March, I'm at this event. I heard this guy and I didn't even know his business coach at the time, high performance coach. I heard him speak from the stage and I was like, wow, it's so good. And I rewatched back the presentation. I texted him. I was like, this is amazing. Flash forward six, seven months later, I'm at an event again. He speaks for another 15 minutes. And I was like, that's that same guy. And him speaking from the stage just... Like the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I got goosebumps. I was like, okay, if every time I hear this guy talk, clearly there's there's like a need here. There's something that I need. Um, and so I asked if I could spend some time with him just to get to see if there's a, a fit. So we sit down for a cup of coffee, which is supposed to be 15 minutes, turns into an hour and a half. And I guess it's a discovery call at that point. But you know what? And I knew he was doing this because I had no answer. Like, I feel like I've studied rhetorical conversations and debate and stuff, but he did what exactly what you said. His very first question, regardless of what I said, his first question was, well, Mark, do you have a clear vision of the life that you want in business, relationships, health, hobbies, friends? You know, like he listed eight things written down with full clarity. And of course, and I said, of course, no entrepreneur has that. Like, come on, man. <laughs> like, like, of course, we don't have that. We're entrepreneurs. It's all up in my head, buddy. And, and I pushed back and he's like, no, 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 no. It's not that not all entrepreneurs have that. The successful ones have that figured out. And in that moment, I was like, 
huh, okay. Like, I can't even work with you. I can't even hire you as a coach today because I don't have this figured out. And if I hired you, the very first thing you would do is say, go figure this out. So I better go figure this out. And it was just because he asked an impossible question for me to answer, just like Mm -hmm. you're saying. And it was right off the top. And every conversation we had after that just kept circling back to like, Mark, I've already kind of given you the answer. So (laughs) I think think what you're suggesting, and I hadn't even considered reverse engineering these initial questions to, to kind of be this black and white, like, do you have it or don't you have it? Um, are there any side effects? Are there any downsides to this type of approach? Well, I guess maybe one side effect is you don't want to leave people feeling like helpless, hopeless, or worthless, right? In the questions. So if you're going to ask a question like that, you should have a next step for them. And it's your job to offer that next step to them. So this is how you're moving through the conversation. So if we go through the set list of questions and I go, well, it was nice talking to you. <laughs> and now you walk Ooh, away going... Ouch. You, 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 you <laughs> tear everyone down to the ground and then go like, wow, it seems pretty hopeless. Okay, man. Good luck, I'm buddy. <laughs> right? Like you don't want to leave people feeling that way. So you get your information. You, you've established like based on the answers that Mark has given me, I see some ways that we could work together. Now, I don't go right into sales mode now. What I do is I ask for permission to put a solution in front of you. So my next step then is to say, you know, based on what you've shared, I do see some ways that we could help solve this problem for you. Would you be interested in talking about what that would look like? So I'm going to ask your permission. And who's going to say no, right, to that at this point? I mean, if they say no, great. That's good feedback for you too. They're probably not the right client or you've totally missed a step with them in some way. But they're going to say yes. Well, now you have permission to start laying out a solution and what that next step is. The thing you don't ever want to do is leave somebody feeling unsatisfied with the conversation they had with you. And so in a sales conversation, in a discovery, I know you said we're going to get to this eventually, but you have to move towards the close. Yeah, let's, and you let's have jump to on issue that, that close let's, language. Okay. Let's get into it. So now I lay out my solution for you. And so I teach a five-step process to a sales conversation. We're talking about discovery, proposal, and close, which are step three, four, and five in my framework. So I've done the discovery. I've now issued the invitation to move to proposal. You've said yes. I lay out the solution for you. The second most misstep of everything I teach is people don't close. They never issue close language. And because you don't issue close language you will leave people feeling unsatisfied or undecided as to what to do next. So if I lay out the proposal for you, I'm going to say, so Mark, does that sound like something you're ready to get started with? Now, there's a lot of ways you can close, but that's just one example of I now am showing respect and saying, Mark, go ahead, make a decision. Now, doesn't mean you will make a decision. You might say yes, great. You might say no, you might ask a question, you might voice an objection, or you'll do what most people get scared of in a sales conversation is say, Nikki, I need some time to think about it. You need to have some type of response to any of those five responses (laughs) to your prospective client when they close. They say, yes, great. Take the money. (laughs) Close the deal. I cannot tell you how many times people are like... Stop talking, basically. Okay, well, (laughs) I'm going to send you over something and then I guess we'll get started later. No, let them sign up right now. Like get their credit card or whatever that next step is that makes sense in your business. And if they say no, check to see why are they saying no? And you just ask that as a question, you know, is it okay to ask your reason for declining? Because there might be some great information in there for you. You you may not be able to earn their business, but it might help you with the next person. Again, they might have a question. You have to give people the opportunity to ask you a question. And the way that you'll give them that opportunity is by issuing the closed language. Now their brain goes, but what about this? If you don't answer the, but what about this question? It's very hard to earn somebody's business. So we got to give them the opportunity to voice a a question. And sometimes it comes up as as an objection. We need to know what those are. We got to uncover them. The way to uncover an objection is to start by closing. Ask the closed question. And if they say they need to think about it, then you better make sure you schedule that next step with them. Don't just say, okay, we'll take your time and I'll uh, get in touch with you next week. No, 
You need to think about it. Great. About how much time do you think you'll need? What additional information would be helpful for you to make a decision? Let's go ahead and get us time scheduled on our calendars to circle back on this. And then that way we can see any other additional questions that come to mind for you. We'll get those answered and we'll talk about next steps for working together. And then schedule a time on their calendar. Don't just let it go. That was a lot. I just did a big, huge brain. No, I just did so a word good. vomit there. This is so good. I'm speaking with Nikki Rausch, the sales maven. All of her social and all of her contact details are in the show notes. So you can totally follow up with her. Check her out. She also has an amazing podcast that I recommend that you listen to. But we are running out of time. And so I want to hit you with what I think is the most fun question. I end every conversation the same way. What is your number one tip or strategy to help us sell more? Uh, invite people to do business with you. Never, ever be afraid to say to somebody, is there ever an opportunity where we might work together? Or how can I best support you right now? Ask people. Because a lot of times they might not have even thought yet about working with you. And when you pose the question, now their brain could go, oh, well, I don't know. How would we work together, Mark? What, what kind of things do you do? Like, how could you support me? Ask for people's business and chances are you're going to have a better opportunity to earn it. Okay, to wrap up this talk, let's get into the three-point roundup. Number one, the number one objective of every discovery call is to simply understand the prospect. Just understand what they want, what they need, where they're at, and if you can help them. That's it. Number two, prepare for the call. I was gonna say when you're preparing for the discovery call, but it hit me that so many people just jump onto calls without preparing at all. So I'm not gonna talk about all the things you should do to prepare. Number two is simply prepare. <laughs> and number three, a structured approach to the discovery call will ensure its effectiveness. Build out a structure, follow Nikki's structure that she broke down here, develop your own, figure out what works through repetition and stick to that structure. Once it works, it works. Keep doing it until it stops working. So to wrap up, a massive thank you to Nikki Roush for joining us. Now she has actually offered every one of our listeners. So if you're listening to this right now, she's put together an amazing offer for you. You can check out a free training resource that she's provided. It's down in the description. It's called Mastering the Sales Conversation. And uh, if you want, you can go to yoursalesmaven.com slash Mark Drager, or the link is down in the description. You can visit her website, yoursalesmaven.com. You can tune into her podcast, the Sales Maven podcast, or you can find her on Instagram at you underscore sales underscore maven. Now, while you're on Instagram, don't forget to give us a follow at sales loop brand. And if you've listened up to this point, it's clear you're serious about boosting your sales game. So why not subscribe? Every week, we bring you actionable tips and strategies, just like the ones Nikki shared today to elevate your sales and to grow your business. With that, I'm Mark Drager. We'll catch you in the next episode.